A woman's voice calmly asked, are we in the air? Two seconds later, they died. We're gonna go through the NTSB final report and the chilling last words of a medical transport flight from Hawaii on December 15th, 2022, on this episode of Taking Off. Hi, I'm Dan Milliken, and we're going to go through the NTSB final report on the Guardian Life King Air C90A that crashed in Hawaii December 15th, 2022. And we're going to look at this tragic crash and hopefully glean from what happened to help us be better pilots and better people. We're going to do a play-by-play -play of the last few minutes with some ATC audio. But first, I want to say my heart goes out to the families of the three people who died. The NTSB final report does level some blame, and we're going to get into that. But I want to make sure you understand that Courtney Perry, the flight nurse, and Gabriel Camacho, the flight paramedic, were true heroes. They were devoted to a career of giving aid, of saving people. And they were in the back of the King Air C-90A, which was piloted by Brian Trepto, someone described as incredibly friendly and loved life. Okay, here's the specifics. And before I play some audio and talk about the last words, let's start with background. On December 15th, 2022, an Air Medical King Air C-90A, which is a twin turboprop airplane operated by Guardian Flight, crashed on a dark evening at 9.12 p.m. between Maui and the Big Island while traveling to go pick up a passenger. ATC communications with the pilot appeared normal until the plane disappeared into the ocean. A nearby small piston plane, a Piper Archer, witnessed the King Air in a circling descent until its lights vanished. And in the immediate aftermath, there was a lot of confusion. People speculated there was a structural failure, especially when a portion of the plane was recovered floating and a known AD, an airworthiness directive, out for a structural issue. So people jumped to conclusions and air medical flights were grounded for a while while authorities attempted to find out why a seemingly good airplane would suddenly fall from the night sky. And then the wreckage was found on the ocean floor. And this particular plane had not only a cockpit voice recorder or CVR, but also had a video recorder and both were recovered, which was amazing. And given that the plane was resting at the bottom of the ocean inverted at over 6,400 feet down. And because of the data that was recovered, a more complete picture of what happened that led to the plane crash has now become apparent. And before we get to those details, it's important to understand the plane and then the pilot. Let's talk about the plane. The King Air C-90A is the smallest of the King Air family and can be flown single pilot, as was the case in this in instance. This flight was a repositioning flight, so it could be flown under the FAA rules called Part 91, which means less requirements. However, once they had picked up the patient, the flight would have become a Part 135 flight, which has more stringent rules. And one of those is a working autopilot if a flight is being operated single pilot, which we'll get into in a moment. This particular King Air, had an electronic attitude director indicator. And here's a picture of the actual panel from the video recorder. This is the accident plane. And you can see marked box number three is where the attitude indicator was. And here's what it looked like on the actual flight that fateful evening. In addition, the airplane also had a Collins MFD or multifunction display, but it was not working and had not been working for the four previous flights. For the rest of the avionics, Brian had an uh, electronic horizontal situation indicator right under the out attitude, and uh, it was a very common setup. And he, he had analog instruments for airspeed and altitude, and below the not working MFD, he had a Garmin GPS, a GTN 650. Of course, an integrated autopilot, and way on the right side, in front of where the co-pilot would sit, was the backup analog attitude indicator. And that was the plane. Now let's talk the pilot. Brian Trepto had learned to fly helicopters in Hawaii before moving to Florida, before a friend who flew in Hawaii for Guardian Flight recommended that he make a move back to the islands in 2019. Brian had about 7,000 hours at the time 
flying, but a lot of that was helicopters. He was rated in both fixed wing and rotor. He held an ATP certificate with ratings for multi-engine land and rotor craft and type ratings in the 737, the Embraer 145, and the LR60. He was 47 years old and had a current class two medical. And according to the interviews in the docket, Brian was very well liked by his fellow pilots. He was very outgoing and did a lot of outdoor adventures with his life partner, Heidi. On the island of Maui, there were three pilots for the C-90A with one working days, the other night, and the third off. And they rotated that constantly. And this was in two week blocks. So the pilots didn't really ever fly together. And since the C-90A was being flown single pilot, they really didn't work a lot together. Between 2009 and 2019, he had received six notice of disapproval entries on his certification records, three for rotocraft, three for fixed wing, two of those coming on his application for the ATP certification. The failures read in part, Poor automation management, especially as to the FMS and lateral navigation situational awareness. And this brings us to Maui and Brian's work with Guardian. He also continued to fly helicopters for a local tour outfit on his days off with permission from Guardian. And during Brian's career with Guardian, he had five unsatisfactory ratings in his initial training, December 2019. During the next few years, he had six check rides, failing three on the first attempt. In each case, Brian remediated and worked on the unsatisfactory areas, and he got signed off on those. I know Hoover is going to do a deeper dive on this over at Pilot Debrief. When he has his video, I'll put a link below. But Brian's inadequacies certainly played a large role in this tragedy. There's over a thousand pages of interview transcripts with the pilots and the Czech airmen and the execs at Guardian, and I went through a lot of it. And clearly the evidence was that Brian was not equipped to be in that cockpit that night. And I mean that respectfully to a fellow pilot who has died. And his supervisors did not communicate with each other about his training to be able to address significant problems. At the time, there was a pilot shortage and many of the operators like Guardian uh, around the world were struggling to put pilots in the cockpit as many would leave for the bigger pay of the airlines. And this was borne out in the testimonies that I read in the interview documents from the docket. Okay, so that sets the stage. Let's go through the short flight that night of December 15th, 2022. And I'm gonna walk through the flight based on the transcripts from the onboard video recovered and the CVR. The recording started at 8.49 p.m. with a good view of the instrument panel and Brian's shoulder and arm. Only the instruments on the far left of the panel were obscured by Brian. Now, takeoff occurred at 8.54 p.m. At 160 feet off the runway, Brian engaged the autopilot. Everything appeared normal. There was the usual ATC chatter as Brian was on an IFR plan. One note was that at one minute after takeoff, Brian talked to somebody behind him and handed them some paper money and then turned back to the job of flying. Two minutes after takeoff, Brian uttered a, a curse word, but it's unclear why. And then a few seconds later, he pulled out his phone, navigated to the music app, and then set the phone on the co-pilot seat. Brian started a standard rate turn to the right, and what we can see is that the electric attitude indicator and the co-pilot's analog attitude indicator pretty much agreed with each other, and this becomes important. He pulled out his iPad to something like ForeFlight, dialed up Glenn Miller on his phone for music, and continued the flight, loading the approach frequency in the radio. Six minutes into the flight, the plane climbed through 8,000 feet, and Brian attempted repeatedly to push buttons on the Collins MFD to try to get it to work. And it flashed briefly for one frame of video and then went dark again. And after a couple of minutes of trying to get it to work, Brian briefly raised his middle finger towards the Collins MFD. At 9.03, Brian informed ATC that he was leveling off at 11,000 feet. Okay, 
that one. I can set that. Two and a half minutes later, the airplane leveled at 13,000 feet, and then at 9.06 and 58 seconds, the autopilot disconnected and the electronic attitude indicator no longer displayed attitude information. It went looking like this. Actual picture from the video, this is what it looked like. The attitude indicator never again displayed attitude information for the duration of the flight. The autopilot fail and master caution illuminated on the panel above on the instruments. And five seconds later, Brian reset the master caution. His right hand was on the yoke and his left hand was not visible. At 26 seconds after the autopilot fail, the co-pilot analog attitude indicator, we'll abbreviate that as AI, showed a bank to the right. A few seconds later, Brian caught it and leveled the airplane. Then at 9.07 and 41 seconds, the altitude alert went off as the aircraft was climbing. As Brian adjusted the trim, the co-pilot AI indicated a steepening right bank again, and then it reversed to a left turn. As Brian worked on hand flying with a partial panel, now at 9.08 and 42 seconds, ATC called him. It's been almost two minutes into Brian's situation on the flight deck. Here's the audio. Uh, 3 By the end of this communication, the AI at the co-pilot would now indicated a descending and deepening right bank turn. At 9.09, either Courtney the nurse or Gabriel the paramedic asked Brian, is our autopilot out? Brian said, yep. 30 more seconds go by and then this. Entry call, who was assigned pilot discretion, maintain one, two, 12,000. 12,000 call, please. Brian set his altitude bug to 12,000 and then the plane began to descend. 9, 10, and 17 seconds, ATC. Brian set the bug to 8,000 and reduced power. Then 20 seconds later, the airplane leveled off at 12,600 feet. Then 14 seconds later, another descent trend. 24 seconds later, another right bank. And then this. Now you're operating on traffic 3 o'clock, 7 miles southwest on uh, Medivac King at 12,000, at 8,000. Medivac King, I'll come through traffic 12 o'clock, 3 miles southwest on TA44, 6,500 northwest on VSY. We'll be looking for uh, 1, 3, I'll there was another plane, a small Piper Archer, in the area, and ATC had told both planes to look out for each other. The pilot had replied that he had the King Air in sight. He could see the lights. Now we're at 9.12 p.m. We're five minutes since the electronic attitude indicator went out and the autopilot stopped. Five minutes. The plane leveled again at 11,120 feet, though he was assigned 8,000. At 9.12 and 34 seconds, ATC reached out again. And now the plane was at 10,880 feet descending and in a slight left roll. At 9.12 and 42 seconds, Brian starts messing with the flight plan page of the Garmin 650. The co-pilot AI shows an increasing right bank. Brian selects direct to that TAMI fix, and at 9.13, the right-hand turn rate increased, reversed, and came back towards, but never reached level. And now, the descent is 1,000 feet per minute. Within a few seconds, pitch became level briefly, but the right turn still increased. And then at 9.13 and 21 seconds, things worsened even more. The rate of descent picked up and roll increased to a 65 degree right bank angle, and this is when ATC reached out again. Uh, three goals to the right flight direct 10. Uh, one three goals to is uh, lost navigation here. We're gonna, we're gonna give it a try. Uh, three goals to the finding uh, 170. Continue right turn, heading 170. Maintain 1000. While Brian responded, the vertical indicator pegged, that's the vertical speed, it pegged at over 3,500 feet per minute. And the AI was at 90 degrees 
in that right bank and the HIS popped the lost navigation flag. And now the airspeed indicator was at the red and white mark, which is the maximum operating speed. And within 20 seconds, airspeed maxed at its 260 knot indicated limit. And the co-pilot attitude indicator showed an inverted descending right turn. The yoke appeared level. The turn coordinator was centered showing a right turn. And by the time he says, the aircraft was past the point already described. It's possible that the AI at this point was tumbled or gimbal locked as it stayed showing inverted and the vertical speed and the airspeed all showed maximum. So three seconds after the hang on, the ambient wind noise was noted increasing. And three seconds after that, Brian's hands were still on the yoke and it moved slightly forward then slightly more aft than previously seen. And as the yoke moved aft, the gear handle illuminated, indicating in transit unsafe gear. The power levels were visible and they were not retarded. So he didn't pull back power. And those two pieces of information are contradictory. If Brian saw the speed pegging out and thought to throw gear out to slow down, the first and obvious move would be to pull back the thrust to idle. You don't want those engines going. It's now 9.13 and 51 seconds. Indicated altitude is 4,000 feet and rapidly decreasing. Wind noise increasing. The yoke seemed to move quickly forward and then aft in a jolt and a sound similar to a loud metallic bang was audible. And the lights on the control panel went out and several annunciator lights came on and now the cabin became noticeably quieter. The altimeter appeared to pause briefly and then start rapidly decreasing again. Due to the quieting, conversation could now be heard. And at 9.13 and 58 seconds, did I break it? Then Courtney made an unintelligible statement and five seconds later, Courtney asked calmly, are we, are we in the air? And Brian says bluntly, we're in the air. Two seconds later, the recording stopped, altitude showing 400 feet. Seven minutes and eight seconds from the time of the electronic attitude fail to the crash. All right, take off, we will leave you. Lost your transponder swap 2243. Hey, Center, we, we saw a plane, I think it circled down. I don't know if that was him. Heat off of Romeo. All right, that was that traffic. Is he responding? Because we, we saw a plane just go down. Hey, Alpha Romeo. Can you uh, observe that traffic? See if he actually went down. Uh, I saw him spin to the ground. Like, I had lights and I lost the lights. Hey, Alpha Romeo, Roger. There is so much to unpack here. For you non-pilots, when you train for your instrument rating, you train to have the instruments go out. You're trained to recover from unusual attitudes of being, you know, banked hard. There was nothing thrown at Brian that shouldn't have been covered in his training. Your attitude indicator goes out at night, single pilot, you transition to the backup. It's actually on the C-90's emergency checklist. He was talking to ATC with no concern in his voice. When you look at the co-pilot AI, it was showing almost inverted. Why didn't he declare an emergency? From the moment the primary AI went out, he would have been justified in declaring. I, I just can't fathom listening to the radio chatter, his state of mind. It sounds like he didn't understand the gravity of the situation. I had mentioned earlier that the leg out was uh, operated under part 91. The problem here was that had he made it and arrived at the airport and picked up the passenger, at that point the flight becomes a part 135. And the rules under a part 135 is that if you are a single pilot, you have to have a working autopilot which he didn't. So he wouldn't have been able to bring the passenger back. So I don't know why he didn't just declare an emergency and get the plane safely down and get it repaired. Some might wonder if hypoxia, the lack of oxygen, is a possibility. The video of the console showed that the cabin pressure was set to a safe 2,000 feet. Hypoxia is unlikely. 
One fair question is pilot fatigue. Brian had flown throughout the previous night, and in the NTSB final report, he had stayed up all day that accident day until he got called in for the accident flight that evening. He was flying after being awake for a day and a half. Fatigue definitely played a role. And Brian did not like the older avionics in the plane. It was brought out in testimony in the docket that he had been very vocal to the company about the old avionics in the C-90A. And before I get the takeaway, here's the aftermath. As I mentioned at the top, the NTSB pointed some fingers, and here's what they found. Probable cause. Guardian flights, inadequate pilot training, and performance tracking, which failed to identify and correct the pilot's consistent lack of skill, and which resulted in the pilot's inability to maintain his position in flight using secondary instruments to navigate when the airplane's electronic attitude direction indicator failed, leading to his spatial disorientation and subsequent loss of control. Contributing to the accident was the lack of a visible horizon during dark night over water conditions and the pilot's failure to declare an emergency with air traffic control. They had 11 findings to support the probable cause. Six of those were on the pilot. Two were on the operator, Guardian Life. The other three were on the aircraft failures and the environment being dark. Guardian Flight went through a very major reorganization. They were very cooperative with the investigation. They actually sold off all their C-90A airplanes and they put the digital Garmin 275 set to attitude as a backup in direct line of sight to the pilot and all the other C-90 airplanes they had. They totally changed the way they hire and trained pilots, exceeding the FAA standards. I hate that we learn these lessons through the blood of people like these three, but I do take a little consolation that the systems have been changed to avoid another tragedy like this. So what do I take away? As a general aviation pilot, this reminds me to keep training. Train for all those things that were in the check rides. Understand spatial disorientation and how to transition to instruments, to learn to trust the instruments, to call for help when I first need it. Even if it turns out to not be a big deal, ask for help. Declare that emergency. This one is chilling, but let's remember them and let's do better. Thanks for watching. We do have sponsor links in the description below. And if you want to see another breakdown of another King Air crash, click here. It was actually the very first accident investigation video we did here at Taking Off. Remember, superior judgment trumps superior skill. Take care.